Welcome to Around the 412. We are part of the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. And welcome also to Victory Monday. With me as always is Smitty and I'm Tyler. What's going on, man? It's our first Victory Monday Monday in like a month. Victory Monday. Yeah, this one felt a little, if you're watching on YouTube right now, different. You know the shirt that Ben pulled up with to, uh, to camp? That's what I'm rocking right now. Nice. But uh, yeah, let's talk about this game because I think that we might have a little bit of different viewpoints here because I was at the game sitting in like one end zone, right? So there's some stuff right. I'm sure that I missed that wasn't going on. I haven't watched the tape back. I'm sure there's stuff that I missed. Um, so that's why I want to start with you. Like, what are your overall feelings about this game? The Steelers do come away with a victory here uh, in week five against the Denver Broncos. I mean, first off, I'm just going to. I, I have to give them a little round of applause because they proved me wrong. Um, I said that they were going to lose, and I just continued to say that I thought they were just going to lose until they could show me a little something different. Again, they're not great. They weren't great. But I think, at least offensively, you started to see more of what we saw in Green Bay in the run game with the offense. I mean, Najee had his first 100-yard game. I believe yeah. he averaged over five yards a carry, and he had the touchdown. Um, I still think that they're not great in the passing game, but you know, Chase Claypool, another guy that I said that needed to, uh, really step it up. He, he did today. He had what five catches five for a hundred. Yeah. And a touchdown. So I, I think that overall the offense performed better than what I thought they had or were going to do and what they had been so far. I still think that Ben has his issues. Um, not just physically, but I still think that there's issues in the passing game with Ben. But, you know, that's basically where we're at right now. But overall, I think it was a vast improvement from what we've seen so far the past few weeks. And I think defensively, they weren't great, especially down the stretch. I mean, Denver kind of made it a game. But Mm -hmm. at least in the first half and earlier in the second half, I thought the defense was performing really well. Um and I, I never felt like the game was out of hand, really. Um, I, I always thought once the Steelers had that lead, I know it got within like the one score, but I never thought the Steelers were going to give it up. Oh, okay. All right, gotcha. I, the way that you worded that, I thought you were saying that you always felt like Denver was in it. No, um, no, no, okay. no. I, I thought I thought Denver was in it at the end whenever I was like, okay, well, now yeah, it's well. like crunch time. <laughs> it's, it's like, what, what are they going to do? But I, I never really felt like – we were hanging on to the lead that well, much. Yeah, I wonder, you know, how much of that has to do with we have a couple injuries to talk about. We're not going to have too much more information until we hear from, you know, Tomlin more so. But we know Juju left the game uh, with a shoulder injury. That did not look very good. He's at the hospital getting tests yes, on I that right now. Hospital. That's... Um, but I, I was just say with the defense, I wonder how much of that changing down the stretch was the fact that Devin Bush didn't play a lot in that second half. He left with what was originally called a leg injury. I believe that they said after the game, you Growing. guessed it groin uh so we'll see that's obviously going to be something to monitor they also didn't have cam sutton today a lot Mm -hmm. of put on james pierre's plate who had an up and down day but hey he's the guy that made the play at the end of the game to seal it um he also had a really nice pass breakup where he almost intercepted it on that was that on the same drive or maybe it was the previous drive one of the last couple drives it was the same drive okay so that would have been like right before um the pass to get them to down to the nine yard line i guess um but, yeah, I wonder how much of that defense, you know, struggling down the stretch was due to them not having Devin Bush in the middle of it. We saw a lot of Robert Spillane and Joe Schobert in the middle because of that. Um, I, there's just – yeah, I want to turn it back to the offense, though, because yeah. that's really what I think the key is here. If this game is going to be – or this game – if this team is going to be at all competitive, it's – you know, it relies on the offense being about an average unit. They could be a little below average, I think, with the defense we have, but they need to be about baseline. And what we saw today – there's some hope there. You know, we'll see what, what Juju status is going forward. But Deontay Johnson only had two catches for 72 yards, but, you know, he could have had a lot more. He had two catches taken away by penalties. You mentioned Chase Claypool. Now let's talk about what we really want to talk about, the run game. The offensive line, and this is something, again, I don't know if I need to go back and watch, and I'll see a lot more of stuff that I don't like. But just on the surface, being there watching this, I thought the offensive line had a pretty solid day today. Um, and you know what? Chukwama Korfor came back into the starting lineup for Joe Haig. There was one time, the, the play where Ben fumbled, where he got yeah. beat, that was like really like the the blemish on this for the offensive line. Other mm-hmm. than that, I thought that they had a pretty solid day. Well, that wasn't even Chuk's guy. That was uh, Dan Moore Jr.'s guy. So, yeah. 
So he he came around the end, but uh, yeah, I I thought the offensive line looked uh, much improved based off the previous weeks. And uh, as I mentioned before, I think that we start started to see improvements in the run game at least in Green Bay, and I think that they just improved on the what they did last week as well. And it, it showed the numbers showed Najee had his first one hundred yard game. Yeah, you know they still need to clean up the penalties. I think that they're taking a little. They, they there's like. What, two or three holding calls, illegal man downfield on Kendra Green, which isn't the first time that that's happened with him this year. Um, but yeah, you just, you're looking for steps forward because we knew that this was going to be a work in progress. And I think that, you know, slowly but surely, we're starting to see some of that improvement. Like, I, you listen, like it's not all sunshine and rainbows. We can both agree, like, we don't expect this to be a very good unit. But the fact that we are seeing some growth there, again, if they can get to like even close to average that is going to just take so much pressure off this defense. Like we saw today, the defense had to play like five snaps in the first quarter, which is unbelievable. Like if you can mm-hmm. do that every game, you're going to be in a lot of football games. So they definitely took a step forward in that respect. What do you think about Ben today? Because, you know, from what I saw there, he was okay. There were the, the passes he was missing were like out routes, short, short yardage out routes to the sideline where he was just overthrowing it too far well, there to was- the sideline. There was one comeback route as well with Juju that he just completely missed as well. Yes, yeah. um, behind, and, behind. I think Sertan was on the coverage there, and I think that Ben was probably the worst part of the offense today, and that's saying something. I mean, considering he didn't have an interception, he had the one fumble, but it's he hard to really had blame. Like two interceptions, though. Oh, I, I know he didn't have the interception, but uh, I'm just saying, like, it's it's good that we didn't have really any turnovers. We had the one, but I can't really put that one on Ben. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's really on the offensive line. Unless you want to say he was holding onto the ball too long, but yeah, you'd hope I, that he would feel that pressure. But again, you know, Dan Moore Jr. gets beat pretty clean, and he's just trying yeah. to do a fire drill. So I, I still think that he was probably the worst part of the offense today. Um, and the reasoning being because I think that the offensive line had improved, um, very, very like a lot over the past few games, and I, I don't think Ben has really been there. And I, I understand he's got the pec injury, the hip injury, but mm-hmm. I, I, I don't think that makes the throws that that inaccurate a lot of the time. And it, that doesn't change the decision making from Ben as well. I, I still don't think his decision making has been stellar to start the season. When we come back and we, we want to you know start previewing this game against Seattle, where I want to leave it with Ben, though, is he did exactly what we thought needed to happen coming into this year, though. Like he just facilitated. He got the ball like throwing the ball short and letting these guys make plays. The yak today was unreal from Deontay Johnson and from Chase Claypool. So he did kind of what we expected Ben to do coming into this year. He only threw 25 passes, and that goes back to you know crediting the offensive line for being able to establish the run of Najee Harris, who, man, again, I think that this is going to be a fun game to go back and watch Najee Harris because he was turning nothing into something even when they weren't creating those lanes. The dude falls forward for four yards. Like, yeah. He, so he's he's fun to watch, man. It's he he was dealing with something too. I'm sure people noticed he wasn't in the game down the stretch. Yeah, he was he like had cramps. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it's funny. Like when you're there, you notice some different things. Like Pat Fryermuth was also like getting stretched out. Like you just wonder how many times throughout the course of a game players do exit and like are getting work at some point. Yeah, because like, not shown on the on field. TV. Yeah. But okay, I, when we come back, we're going to continue to talk about the Steelers. However, we're going to start previewing next week's game against Seattle, which all of a sudden, after Thursday night's uh, game and then Friday news on Russell Wilson, seems to have a lot different picture. We'll talk about Steelers, Seahawks, week six, Sunday night football, when we come back on Around the 412 as part of the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. All right, and welcome back to Around the 412 on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. Smitty, Tyler. Um, let's talk about this game, Sunday Night Football, next week against Seattle. Uh, feeling a little bit better as a Steelers fan, I think, after today. Had they lost, it would have been, we would have started to, next week. We might have been doing a mock draft on the show. I don't know. But <laughs> feel a little bit better the fact that they could potentially get into their bye week at 3-3, three and three, and that looks a lot more winnable now facing Seattle without Russell Wilson, a guy that does not miss games, is going to miss potentially up to eight weeks due to that thumb, or 
the finger injury that he suffered on Thursday night football. Uh, Chris Carson also with a neck injury did not play in that game. We'll see what 10 days off does for him. I mean, the Seattle team just does not look very good. We know that that defense isn't good. They're 32nd right now. I mean, what are you thinking about this football game? Do you think that the Steelers are going to be favored with Seattle coming here next week? Honestly, with Geno Smith, the quarterback, I'm going to say, yeah, I do think so. Um, and maybe the, the the home team that plays into it. Mm-hmm. But I feel like if Russell Wilson was the quarterback, based off of the previous performances of the Steelers, even if the game would have been, played out the same way it did today for the Steelers and Russell Wilson was still the quarterback, I feel like the Seahawks might have been still like a two and a half, three point favorite, you know, um, even on the road just because of the poor play from the Steelers offense. But now that it's Geno Smith and I understand like he's going to get time to prepare, prepare as a starter and everything like that. He's going to get a full week and a half basically because they played on Thursday night to prepare for the Steelers. But I, I just still think that this game is much more winnable than it seemed like two weeks ago. Um, and this still seems like one of the more winnable games on the schedule, even if Russell Wilson was in because of the poor play of the Seahawks. Um, but I, I just feel like now it's like, okay, Steelers, you you kind of have to win this game. You're, you're two and three. You don't want to drop to two and four. If you want to save this season and try to make something of it, you have to win this game. And honestly, I was kind of surprised. I I was like thinking like, are they going to flex it out with the Steelers underperforming and the Seahawks underperforming? I know that that would have happened. It had to have happened like what last week. It's like a two. They don't normally flex this early either. Like I think I know with the the teams being as bad as they could have been. Yeah. I just felt like I think they can do it like once before week eight or something like that. I'm not sure what the rules are. I've seen people talk about it before, but I thought maybe um, just because of the Steeler name, they would have kept it in. But yeah, this game has become a huge game for the Steelers. Not that every game is huge, but like, this is like there's a big difference between being three and three and two and four going ahead, especially looking at the rest of your schedule after this. You got the Cincinnati loss to Green Bay. We're still as the, at the time recording this, we don't know what's going to happen with the Chargers and Browns or the Ravens and Colts. But, you know, three and three, I feel like still keeps you in the mix. Two and four. Again, you know, we can probably start doing mock drafts on here if they head into the buy at two and four, because it, it only gets tougher from that point on. So, but I'm glad that you mentioned about, cause I want to bring up the reverse side of the point that you just brought up about Geno Smith having that like week and a half to prepare as the starter. Now teams are going to have that time now to prepare for him as the starter. Like the Rams did not expect to see Geno Smith. I'm sure, you mm-hmm. know, he comes into that game. That was a little bit of a spark for them. Almost brought them back into that football game, fell a little bit short, but now, you know, the Steelers know that he's going to be the starting quarterback and they can study him. They don't have to study Russell Wilson. He's the guy now. So it, it goes both ways, you know? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you in that. I feel like, yeah, the Steelers definitely should be favored. And based off what we saw today, I, I think that they can just continue to ride the Najee Harris train. I mean, you know, you can, you can find these playmakers, you know, here and there, um, you know, just get the ball to them in space and let them do their thing. Deontay Johnson, Chase Claypool, those are going to be two guys. Maybe we get James Washington back next week. I don't want to completely, like, roll out because we don't know what's going on with Juju, but it's just tough for me to envision as we sit here right now a path to him being there next week. So I'm just hoping we get the rest of these guys back. Um, but, you know, if the offense does the exact same thing that they did today, I mean – Denver is a much better defense. We didn't even really touch on that. Denver is a much better defense than what Seattle is going to be rolling out there next week. Yeah, and something that we also didn't bring up, and since we're talking about rolling with Najee and hoping that he is the focal point of this offense in this game, uh, Ben only threw the ball 25 times. Yeah. Which is like cut in half of what he has done the previous games. So Mm -hmm. if that's the way this offense can roll, if they can get that run game going and rely on Najee Harris to carry them, then it's a lot easier for Ben to be able to facilitate as the quarterback, having that running back back there. I mean, we knew we that the running back was not the problem. It's the offensive line. But if they're continuing to be able to run block the way they have been in this past game and moving forward, then that is a lot easier on Ben to make, make a decision. He doesn't have to throw the ball 50, 60 times a game like he's done previously. Yeah, and, and, you know, it's weird because, like, even – like, it wasn't even, like, game script dictated, right? It's not like the Steelers in all these games were playing, like, catch up to the point where they had to completely abandon the run game. It was just that's how the offense was operating. But today we saw them actually at one point lead by two possessions, which has been a rarity since their 11-0 start last year. 
um, and, and kind of control that, do whatever they wanted to offensively. Like that's the other part of this. Like you can look at the total numbers and see like, eh, you know, like relatively pedestrian, been through 25 times, had like 250 yards, whatever it was, a couple touchdowns. Najee did have 122 on 23 carries, yada, yada, yada. But for me, the big thing was watching them pick up third downs, you know, that in extending drives, getting into Denver territory, you know, making it long fields for Denver, short fields for themselves. Like they, they won the field position battle today as well, which was huge. Um, you know, those types of things, the things that like you actually have to like sit there and think about, not just looking at a box door and saying this is what happened during the game. Yeah, and that's been an Achilles heel for the Steelers so far this season is that they can't convert on Thursday down, or at least they hadn't prior to the, the game yesterday. I, I feel like uh, – Today, they were 7 of 12 on third down, which, I mean, I feel like the games prior to that, they had only converted on maybe like three or four times on third down. Most of their most of their drives were sustained due to big plays on first or second downs. They weren't just driving the ball, yeah. like chipping their way down the field. But we saw that today. Can I uh, – I want to add one thing. You know, I'm, I'm really nitpicking here when I'm talking about actually seeing steps the offense has taken. I should just be happy with that, right? But – to, to nitpick a little bit, Pat Fryermuth, two receptions, seven yards. He, I think that he needs to be way more involved in that, and I think that he's going to be. If you were to ask me what guy benefits the most on the Steelers' offense from you know any type of absence for Juju Smith-Schuster, it's Pat Fryermuth because I think that like Chase Claypool isn't a short yardage chains mover. Deontay Johnson's not that guy either. James Washington's not that guy. Pat Fryermuth is that guy. I think that he's going to be Ben's security blanket sans Juju Smith-Schuster for as long as that potentially is going to be. I agree with you. I feel like he could turn into like a, and I know he's just going to be related because he's the he's the big tight end, but like a Heath Miller role, like old reliable, which I say, and I wrote an article about that Juju is for Ben, and he has been. Um, I, he could turn into that. He's a big target. He can catch the ball. And not only is he good at receiving, but I feel like he's, he's a good blocker as well. And he's just, I feel like he's a good asset to this offense. Um, a few weeks ago, Eddie and I, whenever he he had to step in for you on the show, we talked about mm-hmm. are we seeing a lot of these guys with the Steelers goggles on? And I mentioned a couple guys like maybe Chase Claypool was, but he had a great game um, against the Broncos. But then I felt like Juju, we weren't because we knew what Juju was. We, we know he's a great receiver. Deontay, we didn't. I felt like even with the drop issues he had last year, we knew that he was a great receiver and he hasn't had a drop this year and he had a big game today. So, so that's great. And I felt like Pat Fryermuth, I said it was too early, and I just feel like that's not the case. Like, we're not looking at him with Steelers, Steelers goggles thinking that he's better than he actually is. I think that this guy is the real deal, and I think they need to get him more involved in the offense because I feel like Ben, over his career, has just loved throwing to his tight ends, and he just needs to utilize that more. Especially in the red zone. You know, it doesn't seem like he's really getting any looks. I think he only has the one target, and it's on the little shuffle pass touchdown he scored. So I, I'm just surprised that he's not getting more looks in the red zone, but hopefully – you know, we continue to see as that chemistry continues to build between him and Ben, um, those opportunities will continue to come. Last thing then, because by the next time that we have a show and are talking, we are going to already know what the result of this game is. So what do you think? What is your score prediction for Steeler Seahawks? Hmm. You know, you're putting me on the spot here because I didn't really look a lot into this. I guess it's the, it, I, to think about how do I think Geno Smith is going to play against the Steelers defense? How well do I think he's going to be prepared? And how well do I think the Steelers defense is going to be prepared for him? Um, Because I feel like, like you were mentioning earlier, how how now teams get to prepare for Geno Smith. There's just not as much out there to prepare for than there is for a guy like Russell Wilson. So I feel like that's a kind of something that's tricky for them. Mm -hmm. But saying that, I feel like the Steelers will win this game. And I haven't said that since. Actually, I don't think I've said that at all. Mm, yeah, I'm not sure. At all. Yeah, I'm gonna say. Uh, what's but the, I feel what's the like score? my score. I'm gonna say. Um, I'll say twenty-three to eleven. Eleven. Okay. Well, you said you said twenty-three, and I was like, oh man, he's just say same. Thing. I'm going twenty-three sixteen Steelers in this one. Um, I think that we could see a very similar looking game to this one. Um, hopefully sans Seattle putting some drives together in the second half because Pittsburgh's playing back and just giving them everything. Um, 
But like the first half, like Denver wasn't doing anything offensively. And I hope that that's the case for Seattle. It's going to be interesting. Like, yeah, it's going to be Geno Smith. I don't want to like completely discredit him, but he's got some weapons. You know, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lock, you got to worry about those guys. We'll see what the status of Chris Carson is at running back. But yeah, um, I just I don't think that they have enough left in the tank. I think the Steelers have their winning formula. Not that they're always it's always going to work, but I think against a team like Seattle, thirty second in defense right now, it is going to work. So yeah, I guess the Steelers by a touchdown at home. Um, and I think that, that that about wraps it up for Steelers talk. Unless you got anything else? Nope. I just I hope they continue to roll on this. Um, I know I've been very doom and gloom. If you listen to the show the past few weeks, uh, it's not because I hate the Steelers. I love the Steelers. It's just why I'm passionate about them. Um, but I, I'm hoping that this is a turning stone. But we'll see. They got to show it. We'll see. Okay, when we come back on around the 412, we're going to wrap up today's show talking about the pens. We're going to give some season predictions for who's going to lead the team in some categories and maybe who's a breakout star and an X factor for the team. So, And that's something, by the way, when we come back and do that, as you're watching, I want you guys to comment down below what you guys think. As always, make sure you like, subscribe. We'll be back to talk to the pens. This is Around the 412 on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. And welcome back to Around the 412 on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. Let's talk about the pens now. Um, we've got some good news, I think, and I think the entire Penguin fan base will agree today. Did you see what I saw when I see Sidney Crosby on the ice, team practice, two hands, two I, I was going to say, that is, that is the, the most important part. He's using both of his hands. Yeah, I mean, how, how do we feel about it? I mean, this is good news. He's going to travel with the team uh, on the road trip to Tampa. I People are like, oh, is he going to play in the opener? I know. I, but I think that it leaves the door open for him to only miss like a game or two. Yeah, I was going to say, originally we were thinking maybe, what, two weeks we'd miss, be missing Sid. But now. Yeah. Although, oh, although, shout out to if you've been following Taylor of DK Pittsburgh sports on Twitter. She's been pretty adamant that he's going to come back very soon. Like once the season starts, I think she was throwing out like four to six games, but this, this is very encouraging. I mean, with him joining back in practice and using both hands, I'm assuming he's full contact. If he's back in practice as well, I don't think it's really jumping the gun to say that he's probably going to get a miss, like maybe two games for the, for him being at practice. And I, I think that's great. I think that's a huge thing for the penguins because they need to get him back as soon as possible. Um, b- because of the other guys are missing as well. Um, but Sidney Crosby is what drives this team, so it's great news. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about – we know that they're going to miss Geno for a couple months. Um, Zach Aston Reese – also, right, you know, he's been out with COVID. He's mm-hmm. clear of the symptoms now. Like he was at, he actually had symptoms on like Jake Gensel, um, but he's clear of those symptoms. So now it's just about working back into that conditioning and getting ready for hockey. Um, what do we think about his status? Like based off hearing Sullivan say that, I'm not so sure that he's going to be ready for the opener either. I think the lineup that we saw play tonight very well could be the lineup that we see in Tampa. And that's based off maybe Mike Matheson because he's, left practice with a lower body injury if he's not able to go it looks like it could be mark friedman who by the way got tossed from tonight's preseason game um but i think what we saw tonight is probably a pretty good indication of what we're gonna see in tampa bay opening night yeah and i'm not exactly sure how all the COVID stuff works with the nhl now like i don't know what their protocols are in terms of symptoms and when people can come back and what they're going to do with that but yeah if he's not in the opening night roster i mean it is what it is but the fact that he's being able to come back to practice is a good sign. Um, I, I think you're right. Probably what we saw tonight is probably very similar. And by tonight, we mean Saturday night. Uh, very oh, yeah. similar <laughs> to to, to what point, we were uh, to what we were talking about. But yeah, I mean, getting him back as well. He's statistically the best defender on the team. So getting these guys back from injury. I mean, COVID injury, but you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Uh, is is always a great thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. I broke uh, kayfabe there. I broke that that fourth <laughs> wall by telling people uh, tonight when I meant yes, yeah, Saturday night's preseason game. Um, but yeah, so what I want to do now for the rest of this segment here about the pens is we're just going to go down. I'm going to give you some some stats 
Um, and you're going to tell me which player in the Penguins you think is going to lead in that category. I'm going to start off with an interesting cool. one here. Uh, let's just start with which goalie is going to play more games this year. Does Tristan Jari keep that 1A spot over Casey DeSmith? Yes, he does. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm hoping that he has a bounce back from what was an awful postseason performance last season against the Islanders. I, I think the black pads are giving him the right mojo going into this season. There I'm not go. gonna lie, they're pretty dope. I, I've yeah, never like really him. seen a goalie have like the all black pads. He's got the little bit of yellow on the bottom. I think they're pretty sweet. Um, and yeah, I think that K- Tristan Jari will still be the. I, I'm not even gonna say one A one B. He'll just be the one. Okay. I, I think. I think. The Smith will be the two. Um, the Smith and the Smith is a very capable two. I'm happy with the Smith. I love him. I rave about him all the time. But I think Tristan Dry will bounce back. That doesn't mean I'm confident with him going into the playoffs. That doesn't mean I think he's not gonna, not going to blow up again. But I think as far as the regular season goes, he will be your number one goalie. Well, how many times can we say that? It's like Tristan Dry can do whatever he wants in the regular season, even yeah. the Vezina, and we're still going to be like you know on pins and needles when when playoff time rolls around. But okay. Uh, this is going to be an interesting one because we don't know about guys missing some time here and there. And I feel like this could be a lot of the case for a lot of these categories. But goals, who's going to lead the pens and goals this year? Man, this is tough because there's a couple guys that I can give it I got to. A, I got a dark horse, I think. Maybe. I feel mm-hmm. like he's, he's going to gain some steam. Do you want me to answer first, actually? You can go ahead because I have I'm going Kasperi Kapanen. Okay, that's one of my four I was considering. I think he breaks 30 goals, and I think, you know, with – I'm not saying Crosby, you know, Crosby isn't capable of scoring 30 goals anymore or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I just think that this is like Kapanen's breakout year. I love what I've seen in the preseason. Not sure what that dude was doing in the offseason uh, when he wasn't on a boat or yacht, wherever he was. But he obviously was putting in some work. He looks even a step faster than he was last year. I think his overall game has started to round out more. And the only thing that's going to stop him from just like eclipsing his goal total by a huge margin is if for whatever reason this dude shoots at like a really low percentage. And I just don't see that happening. Um so, yeah, Kasperi Kapanen is kind of like my dark horse to lead this team in goals. I'm looking at like 30, 33 to 35, and I think that's going to be enough to lead the team in goals. I have another name that might be considered a dark horse, even though he is on the top line. I'm going to go with Brian Rust. I can see it. I think he's going to be – I was going to say, I still think that there's probably five guys or so that could score 20-plus on this yeah. team, and he's definitely one of those. I mean, especially with what he's done the last two, three years. And, in the regular and season, like like you said, Sid very well may, or very well may score more than both of them, but the fact that Sid is Brian Rush center and he plays on the line with Jake Gensel, um, I, I, Jake could be another one. Like, literally, that top line, either one of those guys could be the goal scorer. How, Casper how, could be. I'm the about goal to scorer. say something that people are going to think is like egregious. I think that there's the least likelihood that Sid leads out of those three in goals. I think so too, just because of the style that Sid plays. Yeah, he's um, the playmaker. He's, he's the playmaker, for those other two. exactly. And those are the perfect wingers to put in those goals. Um, they're both finishers. I will, I'll just say, like they they both can put the puck in the net. So they're both great with Sid. And I, I'm gonna say Brian Rust. He, I'm gonna I'll say you put a number on cap. What did you say? 32, 33? Like thirty three to thirty five, somewhere around there. Yeah. I'm gonna say that the goals get spread out a little bit. Th- a little bit more, and I'll say Russ leads the team with 31 goals. That would set a new career high. Granted, he probably would have had more than that, actually, in the shortened season when he scored 27. Yeah. But, yeah. okay, so let's just keep going right off that then. Assess. Who leads the team in assists? Cindy Crosby. I, I feel like, I feel that's, like just, that's a little bit easier, right? I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I don't really have to think about that one as much. I, I mean, that's – he literally just – uh, I was going to swear real quick, but I'm not going to do that. He, he literally just like <laughs> produces assists at such an alarming rate. Um, just mm-hmm. like, like we were saying, the style of play he is he's a playmaker. And I think that with his wingers and I mean, I don't know what the power play is going to look like this year. I'm That'd hoping be it's better. I, I mean, is it going to look any different from last year? Are they actually going to be able to score on it? Is Casper Kapanen going to be on the top power play unit? And he probably will to start the year, but is he going to stay on it? Like when Gino comes back? Yeah, you're pro- he's probably going to have to force their hand kind of like in a Jared McCann of last year fashion, if that's the case. 
Yeah, so there's a lot of factors going into that, but I just I just feel like Sid's like just the cop out easy, and it's not even a cop out; it's just yeah. the easy answer. We know he's going to lead the team. Um, I'm with you on that, and that's why. Okay, so Brian Rust and goal, Sidney Crosby and assist, but who's going to lead the team in points is the answer to that. The same thing is it Sidney Crosby. I mean, especially because we we're talking about had we been looking at him missing six weeks of the regular season or whatever we thought that it could be like an extended period of time, maybe that changed this answer a little bit. But being that that's not going to be the case and he's only missing a couple games, you know, no one's going to have this huge lead on him for him to have to make up a ton mm-hmm. of ground. Uh, Sidney Crosby's got to be the answer here. And, I mean, we're playing Tampa Bay the first night, so there might not be any points scored that night. Let's be real. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So he might only be like one game behind everybody else. But another thing that we're not even talking about is with his wrist injury, Apparently, he's been playing with it for the couple seasons. So, yeah. with two fully healthy wrists for That's, the first time in a few hey, years, yeah, you did, you did. So, what's Sidney Crosby going to look like? Is he going to be scary. even better than he's been the past few seasons? It's a scary thought. Um, okay, so maybe not like okay. Well, actually, no, I do want to stay with statistical here for a second. What defenseman do you think leads the team in points? Crystal Tang. Okay, what defenseman lead, do you think he's across the board? Goals, assists, points. Yep. He's the defenseman, everything. Yep. Okay. Well, that's no fun. I mean, I <laughs> listen. I would love to say that John Marino would lead in, a, in a, one one of the categories. I think he's the only one with a shot, right? He I mean, hasn't he hasn't shown me enough to make me think that he's going to pass Latang in either one of them. Yeah, he's the only and one with a shot. He's opening the season apparently with Matheson as his partner. If so, Matheson can play. If Matheson can play. But if he if he can play, that's the pairing that we're looking at going into the season. That was a house fire last year. Okay? That yeah. was terrible. So I don't really know what to expect from that pairing. And I don't know how that's going to help John Marino in terms of his offensive statistics. Especially since out of the two of them, you would think Matheson is the one that's Matheson, probably getting probably more the, of the statistics. Yeah. So, yeah, he'd be the beneficiary. I think it'd be Marina that kind of had to sit back and let Matheson be the roller coaster that he is on both ends of the ice. But okay, so not necessarily statistical questions here, but who's the X factor for this Penguins team? Oh, X factor, Jeff Carter, and I'm saying Dang Jeff it. Carter only because. Gino's out for at least two months. We kept you in the expansion draft for a reason. You're going to be the second line center on this team and you're going to need to play like it. They can't afford you not to play like it because we don't have the center depth behind you to fill in that second line center spot. Yeah, I'm kind of upset that we have, uh, I would have said the same thing, but you know what? Uh, just to go a little bit different, I'll pick somebody else for like my breakout because this guy is 26. So I'm not sure that you can really consider him like a breakout star. As my X Factor, I'll go Danton Heinen because like I think that he's completely a wild card what he's going to be. Are we getting the Boston version of Danton Heinen or are we getting the Anaheim version of Danton Heinen? And they need him. He's going to be playing top line minutes to open up the season next to Jeff Carter. So, you know, at least to start this thing out, he's going to be a huge piece for this team. He's been playing a lot on the top power play. I'm not sure if that's going to continue. I know that they switched things up there the last couple of days of practice, but we'll see what that looks like to open up the season i think that this guy when you talk about the absence of some of these other guys really needs to be part of picking up the slack so i'll go with dan heinen since you took jeff carter um my next one's going to be a breakout player i want to answer this one first just in case we have the same guy i'm Go going with i'm going with preseason star drew o'connor who has carved out a role for himself in the nhl people beat writers and fans alike cannot stop talking about this guy he has earned the right to stick in the nhl last year you know he got his first taste it was kind of up and down didn't really look like he belonged necessarily this year it has not looked like the case it hasn't even looked like he's really fighting for a job he looks like if you didn't know, if you just randomly went to a preseason Penguin game, you would have thought this guy has been a mainstay for the Penguins for a while now. He's looked that good. Um, I just think that he's really coming into his own. He looks a step faster. He looks like he's really buying into Sullivan's system and looks like he's like the perfect player for Sullivan's system. So I- I'm expecting this guy. I, I know he's going to be pro- playing in like a third or fourth line role, but – I'm saying breakout just because I still think that he's a guy with what he brings offensively, even in that role. We could be talking about him scoring like eight to 10 goals, which when you talk about a bottom six player with as many minutes he's going to be getting, I think that that's going to be, you know, a nice little contribution that they get from the bottom six. 
Now, obviously, there's a lot of factors that go into this because, I mean, we're getting Sid back. We're getting Zach Astorik back. We will get Jake Gensel back um, after, what, the one game probably. And then eventually we'll get Malkin back. So when everybody's healthy on this team, just based off what we've seen right now. Now, I know when Malkin comes back, we're going to be a few months into the season. There's got to be a lot of hockey played. But as of right now, do you think Drew O'Connor has solidified a spot in that bottom six when everybody's healthy? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you're talking about how many spots need to open up from uh, tonight. Uh, Sam Lafferty's not going to be playing anymore. And I think really what, what it comes down to, and it's a shame that they – listen, they're they're playing against each other. They're competing against each other. Both have been pr- pretty good the preseason. Really, I think what it comes down to is Drew O'Connor and Dom Simone. And I think that Drew O'Connor just fits what you're looking more for, a bottom six player more. Um Nothing against Dom Simone. Like I, I, we know that we're both fans, um, you know, and I think that he definitely has a role in the NHL. I just, I think Drew O'Connor has been that good. He has been, you know, that good. I, and and he can play center too. That's the thing is, like, we don't. When Malkin comes back, if you're asking me, I'm picking Drew O'Connor over Brian Boyle. Is he this year's Freddie Gaudreau? That's a that's a good uh, that's a good player to throw out there too because that's somebody that I was upset about losing. If Drew O'Connor is going to play anything like what I'm hyping up right now, I, it's going to be that way. You know, he's going to be the next Freddie Gaudreau and the guy that we're talking about. You know, being like an unsung hero for this team that you can move up and down the lineup. Our friend Doug Black he actually threw out that he wants to see this guy get a shot with Gino. Um, the comp that he threw out there. This is going to bring Penn's fans back a little bit, and they're going to be like, "Oh, this guy wasn't very good." But I always liked him. Scott Wilson from those Cup runs was a pretty decent player. He sees a lot of Drew O'Connor's game, um, it, you know, similarly to Scott Wilson. So I don't know. I mean, I mean, we'll see. But I think that Drew O'Connor definitely, definitely, definitely is going to start this season on the roster. And I think even when we get you know the the bodies back that we're talking about by then. Again, this is going completely off how I'm projecting the season to go. He'll have definitely carved out a role for himself, regardless of getting the healthy bodies back. Hey, if Drew O'Connor paves his way to a uh, cup run like Scott Wilson did with the rest of that team in 2016, I'm fine with it. Um, But for my breakout player, I'm going to kind of piggyback off of one of your previous answers, and it's your goal answer. I'm going to say Kasperi Kapanen, and the reason he's a breakout is I think just offensively he's going to break out, like you were oh, saying with the goals. Yeah, if he has and 33 goals and like 60 to 70 points, I mean, yeah, that's a breakout. That's what him. I'm saying. I mean, so his career high in points is 44. I think yeah. he's at least getting 60 this year. And so I think for that alone, I feel like he's considered a breakout player. I think he's going to solidify that the Penguins traded for a top six winger because everybody was like, why did we just trade our first round pick, a top 15 pick for a third line winger? No, he's going to solidify that he is meant to be in this top six. Love it. Okay, last question. We got to get out of here. Yep. Do the Pens make the playoffs this year? Yes. By the skin of their teeth, they do. It's a tough it's division. Good. I, I got to say. It is a tough, it's tough, it's division. A tough Luckily, division. Luckily, Boston no longer part of it. But <laughs> True. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, we it's get still, Carolina back, too. It is. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough division. It's going to be a dog fight, but I'm with you. I think that they still find their way into the postseason, and I think that, again, you know, we're going to be seeing the praise of Mike Sullivan, who probably won't get anywhere near that Jack Adams trophy. But that about wraps it up for us. As always, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the DK Pittsburgh Sports channel. Leave us a like, leave us a comment, hit that notification bell so you know when a new video is posted or when we go live like we sometimes do for the Steelers Today videos on Friday. Uh, we're putting out good content every single day, multiple pieces of sports content. You don't need any other channel when it comes to Pittsburgh sports. So be sure to subscribe to DK Pittsburgh sports. Follow us on Twitter at around the four one two. Of course, follow DK Pittsburgh sports as well as well as the individual podcast channel that we got set up. Um, other than that. Oh, the GoFundMe for Rock Around the 412. It's alive and well. It's our pinned tweet on Twitter. Please share it at the very least. Donate if you can. I've started to work on the prizes now for those who do donate. All the information is right there. You don't need me to read it to you. But I'll just say, in the four years that we've done it, this is year four now, we raised over $10,000 to give directly to families to provide Christmas in our area. It's a great mission. We can't thank you guys all enough for helping us make it come true. Other than that, it's been Smitty. It's been Tyler. This is Around the 412 on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network, and we will talk to you next time. Bye.